Hello, my darlings. Mother Raven here, and I have a lovely tale for you today. One written by Tenjazimani, a shadow librarian on Reddit. The Lady in the Trees. There's a lady in the tree. My daughter's voice was always very matter-of-factly. She rarely asked questions. She simply stated her observations and went about her day. Sentences phrased as questions never ended with a question mark, but a period. As any four-year-old, she had her own idea of the world and a relationship with truth similar to that of a pint-sized psychopath. That's nice, honey, I said, taking a sip of my coffee without looking up from the newspaper. She promptly dropped down on all fours and barked like a dog while pretending to chase after the tail she had crafted out of toilet paper. This was a new game she'd picked up. Usually she enjoyed playing in the backyard. I tried to focus on the article I was reading over her growling. Local man, 34, taken into custody after mental breakdown in Redacted Mall. Please suspect no connection between the incident and the recent disappearance of multiple women. Ouch! I was violently pulled out of my morning ritual as Maud's teeth clamped down on my ankle. That's it. Go to the naughty corner. But Mom, doggies don't have naughty corners. Woof. It was way too early for me to try and argue with this tiny dictator. I repeated, naughty corner now with my special mom voice. What would it take to have one normal morning in this house? Thankfully, she scuttled across the floor towards the base of the stairs with her knee tapping against the hard wood and sat down. The tree lady said to, I opened the door for her. She stated like it was a known fact. She stared up at me with huge blue eyes. They were the color of a stormy ocean trying to reflect a beautiful summer day. An enigma and a contradiction. It's not nice to lie, honey. You're in the naughty corner, no talking. Her fantasy had gotten so active in these last few weeks, and outrageous claims stated her monotone voice had become an everyday occurrence. Even if I knew she lied like all children, Maud's age do, I shot a glance out the window. My calm, nice morning was gone. My ankle hurt, and for some reason, I felt uncomfortable and on edge as I rubbed the skin where she bit me. The tree was at the edge of the property line, edging towards the fields and forest. The bright sun shone behind it, making it seem darker and more menacing than it usually was, some jagged, bare branches reaching out from under the green. And, as a cloud moved in front of the sun, the swaying branches almost looked like they were moving, reaching out like clawed hands. I had played with her all summer under that tree, making a little hideout by the roots, where the tree was hollow. Her favorite game was to put her head into it and say, Who's there? Then she'd come out, smile at me, and proclaim that no one was home, and that we should check in later. The swing rocked gently in the morning breeze and the familiar view snapped me out of my mood. I gulped down a mouthful of coffee and forced my attention back to the newspaper. Recent disappearances of multiple women. The man is currently being held at Saratoga Hospital after he made a number of threats to other shoppers. Witnesses claimed that he talked of people hiding in trees, stealing women, and that the world was going to end. Hospital sources say that the man seems to have suffered a psychotic break after his wife, Sarah Miliband, 31, went missing last Thursday. Police Chief Matheson released a statement earlier today stating that Mr. Miliband was no longer a suspect in the kidnapping cases. I had followed the case through the news for a while. Three women from the community seem to have stepped from their ordinary lives into thin air. The woman mentioned in the article had disappeared from her home. The dinner was still cooking on the stove, her purse and car keys still lying on the kitchen table. The door to the walk-in cupboard was open and a bag of flour rested on the floor of it. The friend who found it had described it to the newspapers as 
snow on the floor. The woman before her, 21-year-old Nancy Duquesne, had disappeared even more mysteriously. She waved goodbye to her work friends and was seen getting into her car before driving off. The car was found just around the corner from her work, barely 50 yards from where she was last seen. Keys in the ignition and the engine still running. The doors were locked. A week later, Lara Marling vanished into thin air after going into a phone booth just out of view from the security camera. You could make out her entering the booth on the security tape, but she never got out. The phone was hanging off the receiver and the line was dead. I looked up towards the tree again. It's okay, Mommy. The lady in the tree isn't there yet. You can look. I hadn't noticed Maud sneaking away from her time out, but she put her clammy little hand in mine. Her auburn braids were starting to become undone, so I started braiding it again. I bit my lip. The tree looked like any other tree. No bare hands reaching out to hurt. Just an innocent tree enjoying the summer's light. The fact that what Maud had said sounded a lot like what the man Miliband had screamed must be coincidence. I had never been prone to interpreting shadows on my cupboard door as ghosts or tree branches against my window at night as claws, so I pushed it out of my mind. But as I rode the car to work, it still itched somewhere inside me. If anything, my curiosity was awakened, and even if I, at the time, didn't want to admit it, I convinced myself that this itch was professional curiosity rather than a pinch of fear. I scrubbed up and started my shift at <laughs> Hospital Psychiatric Ward. I made it three hours into my shift until the itch spread all over my skin. My daughter's words echoed inside of me. As a psychiatric nurse, I have considered if Maud might need evaluation a few times. She didn't connect well with other children, and her speech pattern was different. I had adopted her when she was two, so there was no way of knowing if she was predispositioned to any genetic variations or what her early development was like. She was a good kid, and I knew my profession could make parents a bit hyper-aware. So I'd never gone through with it. But that morning, I thought less of Maud and more about the Millibands, or rather, James Milliband, whom they claimed had nothing to do with the disappearances. This was none of my business, but the itch in the back of my mind drove me to seek out the man, anxiously rocking back and forth at the speed of a heartbeat on a chair by the window. He was holding his chest tense and distressed. Perhaps it was an attempt of comfort. Mr. Miliband? James? He looked at me through the strands of hair that hung dull and sweaty across his forehead without raising his head. I knew he had been given oxazepin two hours earlier, but he seemed surprisingly present, but still on high alert. Would you care to breathe with me for a bit? I continued and carefully inhaled through my nose and let the air slowly escape, me with a soft shushing sound. I was about to potentially harm his progress if I didn't tread carefully. After a few minutes, he breathed in sync with me, and after a few more, his shoulders lowered slightly. There we go. You're doing fine. Just fine. You're safe here. His words were slurred when he finally spoke. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to treat me like I'm not crazy. I'm not crazy. The others just drug it away. The feeling. He coughed. They say I'm crazy, but I know what I saw. There are people in the trees people that went missing. Sarah, oh God, Sarah was in the tree. I could tell he was getting upset again, so I kept breathing steadily, encouraging him to join me. I projected calmness and relaxation to him, 
but inside my gears were turning, thoughts racing through my mind. When you say, in the trees, do you mean in the woods? He slowly shook his head. Maybe I was imagining it. But it seemed to get more and more slurred. It seemed like the drugs were rapidly taking effect. Not the woods. In the trees. Inside the trees. She was baking. She was getting the flour. I was sitting in the living room. I could hear her whisking the eggs. And he started to stutter. I, I, I looked o over and she was opening the cu cupboard and getting in. In. Then there was a bang. I I thought maybe she dropped something, and I I I mean, she had. There there was flour all over the floor in in there, but she wasn't there. Her footprints was in the flour, but not going out. She was just gone. His eyelids seemed to be feeling heavier, so I nodded for him to continue. He seemed to be grateful that someone listened to his story without interjecting or arguing reality. There were police and all of that. They asked me questions in the station. Wanted to know what I had done to her, but I didn't have any answers. I didn't do anything. They, they let me go, and I went home. The house was so empty. There was still flour everywhere. The empty footprints were such a freak reminder, you know. But she was right there. Tell me about the trees, I whispered. More and more people were coming into the common room and I had work tasks to carry out. I didn't want him to feel pressured, but I needed to know, and fast. I was picking up Laura, my daughter, from kindergarten, and I saw her inside the tree. Laura dragged me there, and she just said, Look, look, it's Mommy. I didn't see it at first, but Laura kept stroking this part of the tree, and it was so smooth. It was an arm. I swear to God, I thought I'd gone mad. Look at me. I'm in the frickin' nut house. But it was a damn arm. It was wooden. Like it had been carved out, polished. Then Laura pointed to home. Her face was, half of her face was in the tree. If it was some kind of free fuck pimp prank, I don't know how they even did it. It looked just like her. It even had pine needle eyelashes. Why would anyone do that? He started to raise his voice, and I could see a few of the other patients eyeing us. His tongue seemed to have grown in his mouth, and I don't think they heard but it was time to wrap this up before art therapy class started. James, I need to know, which kindergarten does your daughter go to? A shining bead of drool was slowly starting to form in the corner of his mouth. My blood ran cold and my ears were rhythmically beating with the deafening sound of my beating heart. As he whispered the name of the kindergarten, Maud went to. I went through my day in a haze, performing my tasks robotically. I clocked out, got in my car to pick up Maud. I remember the pit in my stomach. Was it fear? Was I scared of my own daughter? Her monotone voice, dulled by the hollow tree. Who's there? No one home. The lady in the tree isn't there yet. I exited the car and tried to force rationality to control my body once again. This was madness. My daughter was just a child. What was I even scared of? Would I let a psychotic man or the love from the daughter I had wanted so much dictate my view of the world? 
Being a single mother had been harder than expected. Perhaps I needed more people in my life. Adult people. A male figure for my daughter. Was I a failure as a parent? I have to admit that I was, and I'm ashamed for what I did. I headed straight for the tree, and I truly expected to see the outlines of a woman intertwined with the roots and bark, smooth cheeks carved in an unnatural representation of a missing woman. The guilt and embarrassment made me fall to my knees, and my shoulders shook as I sobbed. The tree was empty and hollow. I was a shit mother. I collected myself for a few minutes and fetched Maud, my perfect girl. I bought chocolate chip ice cream on the way home and let her have as much as she wanted after dinner. I knew I was trying to bribe her to ease my guilt, but it didn't really work. I fell asleep crying that night. As I turned the TV on the morning after, I learned that Sarah Miliband had been found dead in the forest. I haven't even realized Maud had woken up, but suddenly I felt her clammy little hand, still sugary from last night's ice cream in mind. She wasn't my mother, Mom, she whispered. My body felt numb, like it wasn't a part of me. I felt see-through and absent. I stood up, put out Maud's breakfast, and locked myself in the bathroom. I just felt empty, disconnected. I was back at the state I was in two years ago, just after I adopted her. I had expected to be overcome by parental bliss, the spirit of motherhood instantly occupying my body. It hadn't. The love I felt for my daughter had been carefully built over time. She wasn't difficult, but the connection wasn't immediately there. I had heard of many mothers going through that, adoptive mothers too. As I went through the motions of caring for her, acting the part of mother, trademark, for the first weeks it crept up on me, the unconditional love. I got to know her and she got to know me, and I became less of an appointed mother and more of a mom. I hadn't talked to Maud about her being adopted. I'd always imagined it being a conversation for when she was older. Now again, I had a stranger in my house. After an hour on the cold tiles of my bathroom floor, the worst of the numbness had dissipated. I made my way into the living room. She sat on the sofa, silently watching her cartoons. She had managed to sloppily braid her own hair, and I could see a little grape jelly from her breakfast dried in them. Maud, honey, I almost choked on the words. The lady on the TV. Yes, Mommy, she wasn't my mother. Why did she think she was your mother? You know I'm your mother. She looked up at me with those big blue eyes of her and wiped nose with peanut butter crusted hand. You're not my mother. You're my mom. My mother lived in the trees. Then I had to go away. Because that's what we do. And I was your daughter instead. I found it hard to break eye contact. There was an urgency in her voice that I had never heard before. When I didn't reply, she continued, I just wanted to meet her. I just wanted to meet her. So I made doors from other doors. And then they'd go through them and they could be in the tree. And if she was, it would be my mother. I hadn't seen her outside of the tree, and I just wanted to say hi. She wouldn't have to stay. The lady could go to another tree then, she said, cringing her nose the way she usually did when she expected to be reprimanded. I didn't know which door and which lady it was, so I just tried a few. Do I have to go to the naughty corner? I silently shook my head no. Is the lady in the tree your mother? I whimpered. Maud nodded enthusiastically. Yes, I see her sometimes. But it's okay, Mommy. I'm not going with her. I'm your daughter now. We can't live in trees. We go to people instead. Sometimes they open doors from other doors and take the other babies and put us there. But babies can't live in trees. Everybody knows that. 
I don't know where those go. She pointed through the window towards the backyard. Come! She grabbed me by the hand and dragged me towards the back door. I couldn't move, even if I wanted to. What are you, Maud? I croaked. The room was spinning, and I could see her lips moving, but I couldn't make out the words. She looked confused, but then spoke. She seemed unsure of her words, like she had never spoken them out loud before. A chain ching. A chain chin? My ears hurt. No, Mommy, don't be silly. Changeling. But shh, it's a secret. The following week, the bodies of two remaining missing women were found. One of them in the garden, one in the same forest as Sarah Miliband. Years have passed since then. I am not a mother, not a mom. What lived in my house is not my daughter. I have fed her and clothed her, but I could not love that thing. It must have realized that I didn't love her couldn't love her. It became more quiet through the years. When she was seven, another woman disappeared from our town. I screamed at it, and it cried. It only wanted to see its mother, it said. She missed having a mother. Words like that should have ripped my heart to pieces, should have forced me to feel some sort of compassion. But I couldn't feel it within me. It wasn't there. I kept it locked up in its room over the weekend. And when it came out, it said it would never do it again. I did more than anyone could have expected, demanded from me. It went to school. It was clothed. I fed it. I braided its auburn hair every day and walked her to the bus stop and left it there. I picked it up when it came back with the school bus. When it was around eight, it changed. I don't know how, but it did. It fell silent. If the fake child living in my house wasn't broken before, it sure was now. I saw it for the last time a few months after. I walked it to school. I remember it well because it stumbled on the pavement and fell. I helped it up. A man with a really nice suit helped pick up her books. He had such pleasant eyes. And I remember finding some sort of solace in his bare skeleton of a world I was living in. It never came home that day. I hope it found its mother. Thank you, my darlings. You know this type of story is just the sort I adore. Please like and subscribe and spread the word. So quoth this raven, and I will see you all next time under the trees.